This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon again. We're now going to have a um, session by uh, Steve Coyne, who's going to talk about uh, Indian military strategy and sales opportunities, uh, featuring the book that he has written and which is on sale. I mentioned uh, this morning uh, in my introduction of Steve a lot of the points about him, so let me just quickly reiterate that Steve had a very distinguished career at the University of Illinois. He has been working on South Asian issues as well as Asian security issues since the 1960s. Uh, he served for a term in the State Department and the policy planning staff, and I think it was in 1998 that you went to Brookings? Mm -hmm. 1998, he went to Brookings as a senior fellow and where he has uh, done a lot of work there on South Asia and other subjects. He's one of the real experts in the world on the Indian military, the Pakistan military security issues. We're delighted to have him again, Steve. Thank you, Marianne. I rarely do PowerPoints. I guess I do one every book. Uh, which means that while I've been at Brookings, I've done about six PowerPoints. And I, I thought I'd do a PowerPoint for this book because I knew that it would be in great demand in South Asia. And one of the first presentations I made of, the, of using this PowerPoint uh, was at the Pakistan Staff College in Quetta. Then I briefed it at the Indian st Staff College in, in Wellington and also at the Sri Lankan Staff College, New Staff College in Colombo. Uh, this version has, I guess I looked at it, has a briefing in London where, where we launched the, the British edition of the book. But it's been in, in, in India now for a couple of months, and it's, it turns out it's a bestseller in India. I don't know if it's still on the bestseller list, but it was started at number three. Pardon? I, I don't think there's a little louder. louder. Okay. Evan? I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just use this. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, I'll just use this and turn this off. So um, let's go through it. It's pretty self-explanatory, and if you need more details, the book's on, on sale outside. Um, the last time I gave it, um, actually it was this version, I think, I'm, not sure, I'm pretty sure, uh, K. Subramaniam chaired the, chaired the session. And I just came from a, a video link downstairs uh, about a, a memorial for K. Subramaniam at Carnegie. We had a memorial for him a week ago at Brookings. And those of you who don't know him, he was as the British would say, a force, very powerful, intellectually dominant person. But he devoted his whole life to defense organization and strategy. He then became known as Mr. Bombwaller, actually Uncle Bomb, because he was out of the advocacy of the Indian nuclear weapon. But I first met him in 1966, 67, when he, when he headed the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. And a lot of the work on this book and my earlier books really was supported by, by Subu. Uh, let me go through this, and then um, it's pretty self-explanatory. The purpose of this book, or this project, was to look at the question of what India will do with its new wealth, and I referred that to that earlier in my earlier talk. And um, so the framework is is that you, India is relevant to the U.S. in many ways, um, and it's a follow-on to a much larger book I did on India emergent power, my first book at Brookings. So the, I guess the questions are, why has India not been willing or able to generate military power since 1947? The answer is twofold. It didn't want to, and it didn't have the money to do it even if it wanted to. Uh, secondly, what are the prospects for military modernization? As in all important questions, we're not quite sure. But clearly, India has the money to buy the hardware. Uh, but the big gap in my judgment, and Subu agreed with me on this, and my co-author agreed also, that it was going to be harder for India to reform its organization rather than not simply to buy the hardware. How would the rise of India affect American interests? We've had a panel on that already, and generally, I think most of us who follow this closely agree that it was, it's compatible with American interest. That, of course, is not to be with the Pakistanis or China, so in a sense, that, that creates a whole new set of questions. Uh, break from the past, uh, rapid economic growth will contribute to military strength. Uh, India has become a nuclear weapon state, but that's, but it hasn't seen the end of, but has not ended its strategic restraint. That's a term that my co-author, Sunil Dasgupta, invented or used, and I went along with Sunil. And we characterize Indian policy as one of strategic restraint. As I said earlier, there have been only two major uses of military power by India, 
One was the, was the, the liberation or the, the freeing or the invasion of East Pakistan, depending on your perspective. And the other was the invasion or the occupation of parts of Sri Lanka, the former a success, the latter, latter complete failure. Uh, and then a, the, an uncertain question is, will they pursue a natural alliance with the U.S.? The book goes into great length about the term natural alliance. You know, it, to me, that raises the question, well, what the hell is an unnatural alliance? I mean, why is it natural? I mean, the term was invented probably by Muraji, by J.P., not J.P., uh, by, uh, by uh, 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 Vajpayee. But American, American uh, Vice President Gore picked it up, and it's been part of the American vocabulary ever since. But I don't know what it means. I think it means that we'll sort of smile at each other for a while instead of frowning at each other. But there are, there are common interests between the two countries, and you see the Americans and the Indians sort of grouping towards an understanding of those interests, plus a whole range of areas where our interests are either incompatible or, or conflicting. What are the debates affecting military modernization in India? Uh, the strategic debate, multipolarity, the, the new world with many centers of power. This was always Jawaharlal Nehru's dream. India would be one of the four or five power centers in the world. The Americans would be another one. Europe would be one. China would be one. Russia would be one. Um, and it's not quite working out that way, but we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, the debate over the use of force, uh, conventional versus nuclear. Indians are wrapped up around the issue of how can they, will they use their nuclear weapons. Subramaniam's contribution to this was to invent a nuclear doctrine which said basically nuclear weapons are unusable, which I think is accurate. But the trouble is that has to be, to, for to work, it has to be believed by other nuclear weapon states, especially Pakistan. The Pakistanis do not believe that they're unusable. In fact, the Pakistanis see nuclear weapons as vital to Pakistani survival. So that's another issue. The modernization debate, uh, technology versus organizational reform. It's easy to buy the hardware, it's harder to reorganize, say, the Indian infantry along modern lines, and there's deep resistance in the Indian Army to changing the structure of the Army, let alone to reducing the size of the Army. When I gave this briefing in, 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 in uh, Wellington, an Armored Corps, Armor Corps Brigadier said, Professor, your briefing implies that there's no need for the Indian Army. I said, yeah. Next question. In other words, there's no need for a large armor corps, one of the largest armor forces in the world. You just don't need it because once that starts rolling towards Pakistan, you know, the nuclear bombs are going to start falling. In other words, it's like the Americans and the Soviets across the Folda Gap in Europe. Once nuclear weapons were introduced in both sides, tactical or strategic, really the difference is where you drop them, not the size so much, uh, then armor becomes, you know, you know, metal coffins. It doesn't become an effective fighting vehicle. I mean, you can use inf armor against uh, terrorists or extremists, or, but that's not an efficient use of armor. So basically, the, there's a big debate going on in the, in the army, Indian army, about the use of armor and the use of tanks. Um, uh, the hard, there's a hardware debate whether they should make weapons or buy them. The goal of Indian policymakers from the beginning has been auto autonomy, autarky. There's a myth that's very important in India and I think it's largely a myth, that India lost its independence because it lost the technological edge to the to foreigners, to the French and the, and the British. And I think if you look closely at that, it turns out that the technology available to the Indian Maharajas and the Mughals was pretty much the same technology that the British and the French had, but it was a utilization of that technology in combat, the organizational structure of the armies that was quite different. And as I said earlier, the sepoy system the invention of the French stolen by the British and then applied in India really made the difference in the Battle of Plassey and elsewhere, and that allowed the British to sort of conquer India. It, is, it, wasn't, it wasn't military hardware. It was military discipline and organization. Um, but there's been a myth in India that they should make everything. Autonomy is important. That's one of the holy cows of Indian defense industry. Well, no country makes everything except maybe the United States. And even there, we have trouble doing it. The Europeans don't make everything. One of the airplanes the Indians are thinking of buying is, the, is, is a Swedish airplane, but most of its subsystems are bought from abroad. Uh, so the notion of autarky is, 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 is impossible. But the Indians feel autarky is important because they don't want to be reliant and dependent on others. And they, actually there's good reason for that because from time to time the Americans in particular cut them off at the knees in terms of military technology. So that's why these new military sales that Jeff Piat is talking about represent a breakthrough and represent a transformation of the Indian trust of the U U.S. Procurement debate, um, is a corruption-free procurement system possible? Um, well, we'll talk about that later. 
internal security. Our judgment is that India's primary security problem is internal. And we happen to, we happen to be in the same position as, an, as a, the, that famous Indian economist, Manmohan Singh. Manmohan Singh has pointed out several times, although not all of his colleagues agree with him, that the real security threat to India is internal. Uh, Noxalites, uh, revolutionaries, disruption. And, uh, and one of our arguments is, one of our recommendations is that not only should the paramilitary, not only are the paramilitary forces been expanded, but that they should get new technology. We think this talk of aircraft and armor and the high technologies is useful, but the people who are out in the boondocks in east, east, eastern India, southern India, facing terrorists really should have the best technology available. That applies to the Mumbai police also, in a sense. Uh, but uh, our judgment, our observation was that in India, as in most countries, there's a 20-year civil war cycle. Uh, uh, and uh, we pointed that out to the Pakistanis and told them that up in the Northwest Frontier province, you have a 10 or 15, maybe 20 year war ahead of you. And the Pakistanis reassured me, no, this will just take three months and we'll be out of there. First we bomb them, then we use artillery, then we shell them and then send in the armor, then, then we declare victory. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen. So I think the Pakistanis have a lot of lessons to learn from the Indians who are very modest in terms of their hopes about ending, the, ending these domestic, domestic wars. Um, essentially, it's an essentially defensive counterinsurgency model. The one exception to really a tough, off, tough counterinsurgency model was that of KPS Gill, head of the Punjab police. But that was not an army operation, that was a paramilitary operation. And Gill went in there and rooted out Sikh terrorists very ruthlessly, violating all kinds of human rights uh, sensibilities in the process. But I think that uh, if the Pakistanis want to succeed, that's what they're going to have to do to, you know, to get anywhere up in the northwest frontier. But, and I don't think they will. What about the Army? Let me t talk about the three services. And the photo is a picture I took a couple of years ago at the Madras Regimental Training Center. And the building in the background behind the statue is a marvelous building. Any of you have been to, up to, up to uh, Wellington and seen it at all? Any, any Tamils? Yeah. That building was built for the British Army in 1857. How about that for timing? And when the British decided that they would stay on in India as after the mutiny was suppressed, or the War of National Liberation was, was lost, however you want to put it. Uh, that building then be, was occupied by British troops. And uh, in August 1947, they marched out and the Indian Army marched in, and now it's headquarters to the, well, I think the Madras Regimental Training Center up, up there. It's a marvelous, it's a, it's a museum piece in its own right. And, uh, so I think that the Army really, um, besides counterinsurgency and light Himalayan defense vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese, They've adopted a strategy of cold start. That is, they will, they're, they're, theoretically, they will get up and go towards Pakistan at the first sign of, of, of a terrorist attack to preempt or retaliate against a terrorist attack. We think it's just a, a, a colossal strategic miscalculation. It's not going to work. And the Indian Army sort of backed away from that since we wrote the book and others have commented on that. So, but it has frightened the Pakistanis, and it's allowed the Pakistanis to justify everything that they've done militarily. And the Pakistanis argue to the Americans, well, the Indians have this cold start doctrine, therefore we have to have an assertive policy ourselves and more nuclear weapons. Um, and Pakistan is countering and emulating it as best it can. And, uh, but I think, as I said earlier, there's sort of a nuclear stalemate between India and Pakistan. And when um, I knew very well General uh, K. Sundarji, uh, one of the architects of brass tacks, the 19, 1987 military operation. And Sundar told me in his retirement, he said, you know, after we've gone nuclear, after the Pakistanis have gone nuclear, there's not going to be another war in South Asia. I tend to agree with him. I think that if, as long as there's reasonably rational decision makers in both countries, a huge assumption, but I think a good one, uh, you're not going to see another war between India and Pakistan. Now, naval power projection. If any of you are up in New Haven, want to see a great museum, there's a British, there's a British art museum on the Yale campus, and I was up there one a couple of years ago, and I came across a series of paintings, like this one, which I think is just a marvelous painting. It's my, it's my, it's my screensaver on one of my computers. And that is a painting of the East India Company Navy. I talked earlier about, uh, jokingly, about branding the East India Company. Well, you could, you could start an East India Company Navy. You know, I'm not sure if you'd use the same kind of ships, but it's, uh, it shows that the Navy has a deep and long tradition 
That Navy was then disbanded, in fact, and became the Bombay Marine, but then, of course, under independent India during World War II. During World War II, it was revived. And Jagat Mehta, who was an um, uh, important Indian Foreign Secretary, was actually a Navy officer. That's how I got into the military. Um, I think the, we, 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 our judgment was that the Navy has a strategic vision that covers all of Asia. It's technically adept, adept and is reconciled to the U.S. Naval presence. 10, 15 years ago, the Navy was up in arms, literally, about Diego Garcia. But now they've accepted Diego Garcia. I'm sure they'd like to actually maybe stop by and see Diego Garcia. Um, and they love the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy loves the Indian Navy. So that shows that deepest suspicion and hostility between our, our bureaucracies can be overcome. The Air Force, these pictures are mine, not my co-authors, <laughs> but this is a photo of the uh, of a painting of the Wapiti, which was a British, light British World War I airplane, which was then converted to counterinsurgency warfare in, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in the Northwestern Frontier Province. It was the first use of air power in a counterinsurgency operation in history. That's the historical significance of this air power. So India's Air Force is running out of airplanes. They're really dwindling down. They're at a very low level. And Ashley Tellis is a great expert on this. We're a large study about India. I think it's called Dogfight, the, the quest for a new round of medium combat aircraft. And, uh, but the Air Force has, in my judgment, in my co-author's judgment, a classical airport, air power vision of air power. That is, you can do everything with air power. Uh, that he, if there's a limited war, you can win that with air power. If there's a strategic threat, you can use that with air power. It's Billy Doolittle. It's the U.S. Strategic Air Command vision of airplanes. Uh, but they have adjusted, I think, to modern reality. And the one area where they've expanded, and Jeff Piant talked about this, is airlift, and, which means power projection. Uh, they bought the INS, they bought what became the INS Jalashwa, which is a huge, giant marine landing vessel. Vessel, and of course the C-130s, which give them tactical airlift capability, made by, made by the C-17s, which gives them strategic airlift capa capacity. So, for the first time in history, Indian decision makers are moving towards power projection. How they'll do it, what they'll do, we're not quite sure, but they're they're acquiring the technology to do power projection. Uh, constraints on military power. I said this earlier. There's no overarching framework for turning different kinds of power into influence. Um, it's an ineffective National Security Council. The, the role of the Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's office is inconsistent. Again, I think the root cause is the lack of expertise among civilians, civilian politicians and civilian bureaucrats. But secondly, uh, there's huge competition between the services. They just are at each other all the time, and they fight for different weapon systems, different roles. If you want to see a bloody battle, look to see the battle between the Air Force and the Navy over who protects Mumbai. You know, do they use, does the Air Force use aircraft? Does the Navy buy the aircraft and fly them to protect Mumbai? You know, they really, are, you know, they really is really different, different, and also the Coast Guard is in there as well. So that's a yeah, intense inter-service rivalry. But given the tradition of Indian politicians staying out of military affairs, you don't get a Goldwater Nichols reform of the military. And Subo and I used to talk about them. They, they really need a Goldwater Nichols system, but they don't have Goldwater or Nichols. They have, they have either one. And I guess we could spare Goldwater. No, we can't spare Goldwater. <laughs> we could spare McCain, but that would be about it. Uh, so they really don't have the expertise. I know some Americans have talked to them about this, like Ed Lutvak and others, and I've talked to them, but they really need to reconsider the higher defense organization. Um, and also there's competition between the Ministry of External Affairs and, De and Finance as well as the Defense Ministry, which is notably weak as a ministry. Uh, constraints on military reform, obsession with autarky, as I mentioned earlier. Influence of Fabian ideology on the state system of defense production. The ghost of Krishnamanan is still there, um, and PMS Blackett, who was a no Nobel Prize winner, was hired by Nero to be his advisor on defense matters and really set them on a path which has turned out to be unproductive. Blackett was not pro-American, very anti-American. So they, you know, they pursued a path which uh, I think was pretty much a dead end. Uh, although, and, but although Blackett was against nuclear weapons, as was Krishna Menon, but um, then they went down that road. Uh, there were studies by the Arthur D. Little Company, and I've never seen the report, and I looked high and low for it. Uh, I tried our Ministry of Defense, uh, our Department of Defense, Indian Ministry of Defense. Nobody seems to know where it's at. Subhu Subramaniam said he had seen it, but didn't have a copy of it. 
But the Arthur D. Little report apparently recommended uh, major changes in defense organization and, and military acquisition. And later on, and we talk about this at length, Arun Singh, who I've talked about earlier, one of the few Indian politicians who knew defense matters and still does know them. There were a couple of Arun Singh reports, and they've been primarily put on the shelf, and Indians cannot really implement them. And Subramaniam, in particular, was, was irritated at this lack of movement on these issues. Um, that what are the downsides of civilian supremacy? My first book was my dissertation on, the, on the, how India was unique in having civilian control over the military. But it turns out, now 40 years later, come to a little bit more wisdom, that uh, really uh, there's a downside to civilian supremacy also. It's a relationship with the armed forces based on suspicion and disrespect of, of professionalism does not work very well. Indians are very suspicious in, uh, of, of, the, of the military. They're growing out of that, but for decades, there was a fear by the politicians that the military were gonna launch a coup against the government. And Krishnaman and Nehru were very suspicious of the, of the Indian army of their time. Uh, I think uh, Indian officers tell me, you know, they say they look at Pakistan and see what, what a great job the Pakistan army has done in running Pakistan, which is enough to dissuade them from ever trying to run India. And, and the Indian, Indian military say, you know, who would want to run this country? I mean, it's just not, it's too, it's, we don't want to run it. I think, I think that's actually the attitude of the Pakistan army. I, I joked with Kiani, in fact, I said, you know, a couple of, when Obama got elected, there was a headline in The Onion. It said, black man gets worse job in America. <laughs> and I think that from a military man's point of view, being president of their country, having to take all that public criticism and having to make everything run on time, that's not an attractive job. Most of them would just rather do their professional thing. So, but there is suspicion of the military still, although politicians are eager to wrap themselves in the military flag, to be at the ribbon cutting ceremony when they, when they, when they build a new airplane. And of course, to boast that it's entirely Indian from top to bottom. Way back when I was in the State Department, uh, you, uh, remember we worked on the LCA? I don't know if you were involved with that. The Indians put in, talked to the Americans in 1965 about the light combat aircraft. It was incredible. Well, it still hasn't flown. <laughs> and the only thing Indian about it, apparently, is the air in the tires, if that. <laughs> so it's just been a bad experience. And I, there was a WikiLeak, in fact, uh, in the leak to the Financial Times, and by, at, by at Ambassador Romer, now the ambassador doesn't write the cables, but he signs the cables. And somebody had visited the HAL factory in Bangalore, which I've seen a couple of times, and it was a very critical report. Now you don't know whether that's the only report or whether there are other reports, but there's deep suspicion, at least in my mind, I don't know about the US government's mind, about the, quality, the competence of the Indian defense sector to produce high quality equipment. They're doing some of it in some places, but basically, it's a government bureaucracy trying to do innovative work, and that just doesn't go together. Uh, secondly, development requirements, a euphemism for being a pure country, permeates the security and weapons acquisition decisions, as I've said that. That's, and will the rebalanced uh, federal relationship between the state and the, and the center change, uh, change the defense policy? That's a big question mark. We, don't, we have no good answer to that question. Conclusions, one set of conclusions. Uh, India neglects organizational modernization in favor of hardware modernization. It's easier to buy the hardware and then use it not to its ultimate, ex full, 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 use, it, use it inefficiently than to reorganize, your, your, to reorganize. Procurement decisions are foreign policy decisions, important point. Uh, Ashley talks about this also in his paper. Uh, by and large, we think that Indian foreign policy has been steered by defense acquisition policies, not the other way around. Indians were very pro-American and very pro-British early on, because that's where they got their weapons from. And then later, they became very pro-Soviet, because they were, the Soviets were the ones who sold the weapons. And then later after that, they became very pro-Israeli, because Israel provided a huge pipeline of technology to India, including upgrading the Soviet aircraft, all the MiGs and so forth. And now they're very pro-American because American tech military technology may be available. So you could argue that in both ways, that non-alignment or alignment dictates acquisition, or you could argue that acquisition dictates alignment or non-alignment. We think obviously it's a mixture of the two, but right now India's changing alignment, or at least closer relationship with the United States, makes it politically possible for them to buy from the United States with the one caveat 
that they are desperately worried about the America turning against them and cutting off the supply of spare parts or a pro project in the middle of, of its development cycle. Um, so for, you know, procurement decisions or foreign policy decisions of the six aircraft, two are American, one is Russian, one is uh, European, and one is, I guess, Swedish. And you would think that, that uh, they might, I, I, I wouldn't be, begin to predict what they would do except maybe to split the difference and buy partly American, partly European or Russian. Um, Ashley's view is that that would be a mistake. They should have all the aircraft from one country. You know, so this, you don't get confused the, so, the supply, you know, the supply lines as for, any further. Uh, but we'll see how that plays out. They may simply defer the decision for another couple of years, in which case the Indian Air Force won't have any fighter, fighter points. Will there be a tighter alliance relationship between the US and India? Probably not. Uh, cannot be against Pakistan. And it's premature for both countries to align against, 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 against China. But I think that in both cases, it's in the American interest and the Indian interest to hedge their bets against a failing Pakistan and a rising China. But not to declare an alliance as such, but really to have a working arrangement. So if Pakistan does begin to come apart at the scene, scenes, which seems, which I think, it, well, that's a possibility. Or if China does turn aggressive and assertive, which is also a possibility, then the U.S. and India have a working relationship. Our, our, our communications systems are compatible. Our politicians know each other. So that's why I'm much in favor of this present love affair between the U.S. and India. Um, India remains, I think, a long-term strategic investment uh, from the American point of view, but a good investment. And I, you know, that's why I've been very supportive of the U.S.-India relationship. Second set of conclusions. Um, uh, somebody asked us uh, what three recommendations would be for, for a President Obama. I would say something that's extremely unpopular in Washington, reorganize. Uh, we have an organizational structure between, between PACOM and CENTCOM, which is extremely dysfunctional. CENTCOM is trying to keep the Indians out of Afghanistan. PACOM is trying to get the Indians into Afghanistan. And of course, you have the split between the Holbrook office, uh, uh, AFPAC office on the one hand, and the rest of the Department of State on the other. So I think we just don't have our organizational act together. So I think it's important to uh, have a regional approach. And Bruce Rydell, my colleague at Brookings, and I turned out to actually be in perfect agreement on one thing, and that is that, that we need a, a, a South Asia command based somewhere in the region if possible. Um, that is a command that looks at India, Pakistan, Afghanistan as a whole, and maybe the Indian Ocean. Uh, guiding principle should be that America should support military modernization in India, where American and Indian goals overlap, and by and large, it's, it's pretty much overlap. Um, Afghanistan, I think, is theoretically the best prospect for strategic partnership with India and Pakistan. And a few of us in Washington argue that the regional approach would not only involve America and Iran, which is two, an odd couple if there ever was one, to a call talking about Af a, a neutral Afghanistan, but also India and Pakistan. Because I think that both countries have a common interest in a non-aggressive, non-assertive, neutral, set more or less secular Afghanistan. And that the American policy should be to get them to understand that as best we can. And finally, uh, avoid fueling both sides of an arms race. Paradox paradoxically, nuclear weapons make this easier. We can make arms sales to India and to Pakistan without worrying too much about precipitating a war because, ironically, the nuclear factor dampens down the likelihood of a nuclear war, of a, of a will at war between the two. That's not, a, that's not a cheerful prospect, but I think it's reality. I think that may, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Would anyone like to ask Steve a question? We've got, a, I think, time for one or two. Oh. Back there. Can you um, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the strategic uh, alliance with uh, Israel and what that means for India in the Middle East? And I guess a little bit more about India's yeah. interest in the Middle East. I think the Indians realize that um, being chronically anti-Israeli uh, brought no benefits from the Arabs at all to speak of. I mean, it was to, and, and the argument internally that if we say one nice thing about Israel, our Muslims will rise up in anger and rebellion was, was proven to be false. 
Indian Muslims are far more realistic and secular than, than I think that argument gave him credit for. So, and, the, and also the Israelis were holding out the temptation of all kinds of hardware. They're very good at integrating Western technology and Soviet equipment because they had captured huge amounts of it from the Egyptians and maybe other countries as well. So they were the world's experts in modernizing and upgrading MiGs uh, and, also, and also Soviet tanks. So the Indians had, were, had an inventory filled with MiGs and Soviet armor and uh, the Israelis worked extensively and it, it came to billions of dollars a year you know, sales for the Israelis. And there's Israelis in all over India now, or parts of India, you know, working in tech, uh, technical issues. So I think the political alignment was not so strong that, the, the, to, uh, that it overcame the, uh, the temptation of dealing with the Israelis and a military partner. And, and pretty soon they became fast friends. Uh, and the Israelis have been careful to keep a low profile in, in India. What the Indian position will be on the democrat democratization of the Arab world, I do not know. That's going to be an interesting question for Indians to figure out. Do they want to see democracies in these autocracies where they've had good relations, as have we? I don't know. Of course, this, this is a problem facing the Israelis as well. No. Marion, can I? One more. Thank you. Right, right here. Have a mic coming to you. Sir. Okay. Uh, can you comment on China using Pakistan as a proxy state? against India, and what is the defense implication of that? Yeah, China began to use Pakistan. Pakistan was a twofer from the Chinese point of view. Pakistan was a close American ally, and I put close American ally in double quotes, uh, but also um, supporting Pakistan weakened India. And after the 62 war, you know, India and China, you know, were, were rivals or competitors. So it was, a, it was an easy call for the Chinese to move towards Pakistan, and the Pakistanis were eager to, the Pakistanis were nervous about the American relationship, so they wanted China as well. So it's a classic balance of power game, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend and so forth. But I think that, as I said earlier, the Chinese get something out of it. They get access to the Islamic world, which the Pakistanis have provided. Uh, now they get access to Afghanistan and, 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 and Pakistani mineral sources. The Chinese are sucking up a lot of minerals from Afghanistan and Pakistan. In terms of actually developing Pakistan, Chinese are not doing very much. Um, but the Chinese are very, we talked about this in the earlier panel, really very popular in Pakistan as a strategic friend. Um, and what it's meant for the Indians is, I'm just repeating myself, you know, they've lost the strategic unity of South Asia, which the British left to the, left to the India has, been, has gone now. And first the British were in there with Pakistan, then we, can, we, joined, we allied with Pakistan. Now the Chinese have become a fixture in South Asia using, using Pakistan and other countries. And I've talked to Jaswan Singh and others about this, and they, I think this is a strategic fact of life that they're un unhappy with, but there's not much they can do. From an Indian point of view, you can either be so nice to Pakistan that they don't need China, or so nice to China that they abandon Pakistan. But I think the reality is that the Chinese can overcome with inducements and incentives anything the Indians are likely to offer. The Indians would have to offer a big deal on Kashmir and symbolic agreements, which would ease the, the Pakistani military's mindset, plus arms control agreements. But I don't think the Indians can do that, and I think the Chinese can counter with more military technology, nuclear technology, nuclear weapons technology, which they're doing. Yeah. Steve, can I, Marian? Uh, yes, go ahead, Jack. Uh, it's Steve, your panel, so. <laughs> uh, do, do, uh, do you see the possibility of uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, India creating a strategic military alignment with U.S. as a partner like a NATO that we had on the European side, either just for defensive purposes or rise of China containment against that? It seems like there is already some alignment taking place among those four nations with India, in addition to U.S., and they're all U.S. military strategic partners. Uh, they all have got the weapons from the U.S., you know, technologies by and large. Do you see that architecture arising uh, or not? And I have a second question. No. That you want to say. Probably not, Jug. I just okay. don't see it. Those are fairly stable states for the most internally, for the most part. The, what troubles me are the states to India's, around India and to India's, India's west where the internal, the internal decay is clear. And I've been arguing since the fall of communism, 
that what re would replace communism for the idealistic 17, 18, 19 year old boy or girl would be ethnic identities or tribal identities or religious identities. In Pakistan, get all three together. Mm -hmm. That the state itself, you know, I would, I, in a sense, it's too bad that Pakistan didn't have a strong leftist movement because it would have suppressed some of these separatist movements. So what's, so what's happening in many states is that religion, religion, ethnicity, tribalism, these these are the organizing principle for for, the, for groups that are unhappy with the state, and uh, and the states can't modernize fast enough to accommodate them. So I see this as in, in long term troubled regions from India to India to us. India is a model in how to manage these things. But it's hard for countries to emulate India in this regard. No. The follow-on question, uh, uh, I guess a couple of years ago in the F-16 dogfight between the Indian Air Force and yeah. the U.S. Air Force, uh, the public press suggested or mentioned that Indian Air Force outsmarted the American Air Force on their own plane. Yeah. And one of the explanations was the diversity of equipment and the low quality of equipment with which the Indian uh, captains were used to and therefore they were able to outsmart yeah. what would be otherwise a machine driven, you know, uh, automated approach. Uh, any comment on that? Uh, why, I think why, that, I think what, what is your explanation of why the Indian pilots were able to do so well despite being trained on uh, yeah, well, multiple technologies, maybe more obsolete technologies? I'd want to talk to some of the American pilots as to whether that really happened. Oh, okay, um, okay. And so I'm very skeptical about that. Um, but in, in these kinds of things, uh, it's really, and I, I've heard one version I've heard from an American, in fact, we turned off some of our systems to sort of make it possible for India to do this. But you know, when you play a, a friendly match, like, like cricket, you don't want to humiliate the other side, you want to let them win something. So I'm not, but I'm not sure if that's true either. But I, this, this deserves more independent scrutiny. But I'm, I'm skeptical of just saying, you know, the assertion that somehow India outsmarted the American, Indians out, outsmarted the American. Indian pilots are good. Uh, Pakistani pilots are also good. American pilots are also good. The technology is probably more important than all of this put together. So, and the match of the train, pilot training and technology is critical. But it really, in this, this kind of large scale combat aircraft, it's system integration, ground air and, and, and so forth. And if you turn off some of your radars, of course, you know, you'll be vulnerable. So that's why I take this with a grain of salt. Which is not to say the Indian pilots aren't good. They are, they are good, yeah. Even though most of them grew up flying, you know, very dangerous airplanes, the MiG-21. MiG Maybe a survival of the fittest, that operator. Yes, sir. Hey, David. I think if I were in the uh, Indian uh, Ministry of Defense, I would not be worried about Pakistan um, as long as the Pakistani army is there. I'd be worried about the Pakistani army falling apart and then all those nuclear weapons um, sort of lying around for no. grabs. Can you comment on what are the contingency plans for disposing of or removing that uh, those nuclear weapons, either American or Indian or anybody else's? No plans, contingency plans for removing loose weapons if that system begins to fall apart organizationally? Yeah, that's a question the Pakistan army is deeply worried about. They're worried that somebody's going to try and take their weapons away from them. And they put a lot of time and effort into making sure that doesn't happen. And uh, since there are now allegedly 100 weapons presumably dispersed around Pakistan, any attempt to take them away would be, would be all you have to do is miss one or two and you're in big trouble. That means New Delhi and Mumbai, or New York and Atlanta, whatever it is. So I think that uh, Pakistan is in this weird position of being a country, I won't say failing, but really in deep trouble, yet everybody wants it to hold together because of the nuclear weapons. I just made that point earlier. So I think that, um, so, but in a civil war in Pakistan, if it got to that point, in my Pakistan army book, Pakistan future, Idea Pakistan book does talk about that scenario. Then, uh, then you worry about who's in control of the nuclear weapons, the integrity of the army over to m make sure those weapons remained under control. When the, uh, when the bodyguard to the pr governor of Punjab assassinates the governor of Punjab, when Benazir Bhutto, the leading personality that he produced in, in a decade or two, gets plugged even though they knew she was at risk, you wonder how secure those weapons are. All we can do is speculate. But the Indians should be nervous about this. I know the Americans are nervous about this. I don't know if the Chinese are nervous about it, but they should be also. 
So if a, nucle a nuclear weapon or device got in the hands of some kind of terrorist group gang or something like that, who knows what they would do with it? Just not sure. Well, I have no, I have no, I'm free to talk about anything because I don't have access to classified information on this. So I can speculate, but uh, I'd say probably not. I, I don't know what the contingency plan would be, except to die gracefully. You know, and you know that um, if, uh, if the Indian radar spotted a few airplanes headed from Pakistan, they might shoot them down. But well, the Pakistanis don't need airplanes, and that's why the Indian Air Force acquisition of fighter planes is almost irrelevant. Pakistanis have lots of missiles. Their primary delivery system of a nuclear weapon would be a missile. These are probably North Korean weapons, North Korean designed or Chinese designed, transferred to Pakistan. And you can't stop those. It's impossible. Uh, so in a sense, there's nothing you can do. India has built one or maybe two underground shelters for national command authority, which means the prime minister. And they're located in Delhi and outside of Delhi. People have seen the holes being dug and so forth. Everybody knows what they're at. So presumably they're targeted by the Pakistanis also. It's a lot like our relationship with the Soviet Union. You know, we knew, we knew that if they wanted to attack us, they could hit any place that they wanted to. Therefore, we kept on building more and more weapons and more and more weapons, piling them on so that if they did attack us, we'd have enough to destroy them, and that was the basis of deterrence. I think India and Pakistan have reached that level now, but especially in the case of Pakistan, they seem to think that more is enough. That's true of all nuclear weapons establishments. More and better is enough. And I'm not sure about the Indian response, but both countries, especially India, would have to test to get a workable, provable nuclear, thermonuclear device. So I'm a little nervous about whether, you know, if things got hairy between the two, they might not go to the next level of, a, of testing, testing weapons. That would be part to show their macho, that they can go to the next level. But that puts them on the same escalator that we and the Soviets were on. I think it's an, an escalator that doesn't lead anywhere. Ironically, my career, I began as a strat nuclear strategist at the University of Chicago, and then I decided I'm going to go to some part of the world where nuclear weapons are not important where there's a leader who's condemned nuclear weapons, Jawaharlal Hello Nehru. And I'm going to study their defense policy and their army. Of course, it caught up with me. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're, this is one of the centers of new thinking about nuclear weapons. Fortunately, they've avoided, I think, going down the American path. They're aware of this. But that's not true of the Pakistanis, I think. The Pakistanis emulate us. They see us as a role model. More is enough. Last question because we have sure. to make some way for the next panel. Uh, Narayan Komarath again, and, and I'm speaking as professor of aerospace engineering at oh, uh, Georgia Tech again. Uh, just a point of information. I think the light combat aircraft of the Indian Air Force uh, flew first on January 1st of 2001. And as of January 10th of this year, they, it was handed over to the Air no. Force. How many? Which leads to my question, actually. Yeah. What do you see them, uh, what, is a, what is your projection for the path that uh, India is going to take for domestic defense innovation, R&D, and procurement? Because clearly that's, that's not no. working terribly well. Yeah, the, the, back in the 1970s, Subramaniam and I and others talked about opening the private sector to defense manufacturing. And there's some entry now of private companies into this. Uh, Hindujas are involved with this. They bought a I think Ashoka Leyland or something like that, and I know the Tatas are involved with it. And the, in shipbuilding, there's some, there's some important private, private, private shipyards. But most of it is kept in the in, in Ministry of Defense production, in the government arsenals, who are uniformly not that competent. Um, so I, but if they were to liberalize and open this up to private enterprise, that may, that may facilitate the transfer of technology from the West to India. The downside of this, of course, and there's a huge downside, and I just have to quote Dwight D. Eisenhower about the military-industrial complex. Once you get private companies deeply embedded in the defense production business, the money spent on politicians and bribes will be enormous. I mean, they have problems now. So, you know, do you want a more efficient system with, uh, in terms of defense production, which may open itself up to corruption and, and political influence, or do you want a system which is not efficient but which is more or less honest? And I. And I DRDO? Uh, yeah. 
you know, the, the Navy is pretty good, and the Navy has a self-contained ship design program, unlike the other surfaces which have to go outside to buy. So the Navy has us under control, I think. Um, the Army probably lacks technical expertise in this. Again, the Army, until recently, was obsessed with tanks and armor, and they kept on buying the latest generation armor, which would simply be in an oven to fry the, uh, cook the, the occupants in a nuclear war, so they're really irrelevant. But again, the area where they need development, and I'm not sure if it's coming, is in, is in assisting the paramilitaries. They really need help. They really need light, light air transport, moving through the jungle, bush, and so forth, as well as light weapons and so forth. They really need that. Uh, but of course, the ultimate solution to the in domestic insurgency is good government. And the Army, Indian Army and the Indian paramilitaries are the first to tell you that that what really count, the real enemy, the real, th the real capability against th this terrorist threat is good government. If you have good government for a while, the terrorists go away. No. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.